uh, we're talking about nuclear energy for the largest part here, but uh, we're not talking about necessarily the existing fleet of uh, light water reactors that are out there producing power in the U.S. We're talking about options that, uh, that include smaller reactors, they can include reactors that are gas cooled, and we have other options that are out there. People are talking about all, all kinds of different uh, fuel cycles and reactor designs. Uh, the role of nuclear energy in the future may be determined by these advanced reactors more than the reactors we have operating today. And while the economics of nuclear power face significant hurdles right now, given low power prices, which is an issue I, I hope everyone will, will keep in the back of their minds and address as they speak, our speakers are going to talk about some of the policy issues that affect nuclear energy going forward and what can be done by the government or perhaps by private industry uh, in the future and what uh, that landscape might look like. The three speakers that we have today uh, all have extensive backgrounds in nuclear energy. It's, uh, it's a given that nuclear energy is, uh, is a field filled with 65-year-olds, but uh, this is a good example of a cross-section of the nuclear industry today, which is a separate panel, which I've seen done before. But I'm hoping that the speakers will uh, convey to us their enthusiasm for nuclear energy, which I know they have, but I'm hoping that they'll also address the role that it might play today, given, given the uh, financial issues that are facing uh, the energy industry and the electricity industry. And I'm hoping that they will uh, describe for us some futures that they see uh, for our energy landscape. Uh, we're going to have each panelist present for about 10-12 uh, minutes, and then we're going to hopefully get a good long uh, discussion going afterwards with the Q&A. Uh, my name is Bill Freebairn. I'm the managing editor of Platt's Nucleonics Week, which is a weekly uh, newsletter devoted to the global nuclear power business. And uh, I'll be asking some initial questions when we finish up, and then I'll be throwing it open to the audience for questions. Our first speaker is Jack Bailey, and, and Jack is a good example of somebody who has uh, been around the nuclear power industry for a very long time. Uh, in fact, Jack is, uh, is, is, has moved around so much that in a short period of time he's managed to work for two different small modular reactor vendors of the four that there are, and that industry is only about four years old. Um, he's currently Senior Vice President of Business Development at New Scale Power. He joined New Scale in May uh, into his current position. He previously worked with Generation M Power, which is a joint venture of uh, B&W. A large nuclear company, but prior to that, he spent uh, quite a bit of time working for the Tennessee Valley Authority, which is one of the largest uh, nuclear reactor operators in the United States. He headed up uh, new nuclear power development efforts at TVA, including the possible use of uh, AP1000 reactors and SMRs for their new nuclear options. Uh, before that, he was involved with the supply planning group and had been vice president of nuclear engineering and technical services. He previously worked for uh, a nuclear power plant, Palo Verde, out in Arizona, where he was uh, Vice President of Engineering and Vice President of Technical Support. So obviously, uh, Jack has a lot of experience with the big nuclear reactors that are out there keeping the lights on. But today, he's going to talk to us about his latest uh, involvement with New Scale, which is one of the four US-based vendors of small modular reactors. And uh, Jack, why don't you talk to us about that? Well, thank you very much. Um, appreciate everybody attending. I thought I would start off the presentation, and I might make sure it's working first, uh, with a big picture view that uh, I'm not an expert in, but I think it's a uh, backdrop behind what a lot of us are trying to find a solution for going forward. This is a, uh, a simple graph that shows the 2005 emissions of carbon uh, by sector, whether it's electricity, transportation, industrial, residential, commercial and uh, it's from the EIA data for that year and then projects if we were to see an 80% reduction, which is what a lot of folks say we need to achieve by 2050, what would that level have to be? <clears throat> I, I highlight that in the electricity sector in particular, I believe we have solutions near term that can dramatically reduce that. We have been reducing it are we, uh, from 2005 already, coal plant, uh, 
production has probably decreased by about 25 percent but a lot of that has been replaced by gas uh, so you can't replace all the coal with gas and expect to meet a target uh, in this area because that would only replace about 50 percent of the carbon <clears throat> the uh, the most aggressive scenarios and actions that we're taking today aren't coming close to meeting this target. And so the key is, if we have a technology or technologies that can be deployed over the next 15, 20, 25 years, that can substantially reduce any one of these sections by close to 100%, we probably should pursue it because we're not going to get that kind of reduction in every one of these sectors. I will say that nuclear combined with renewables can do a lot to reduce the electricity sector now. I will also say that nuclear in the long term can probably do a lot to contribute to both the transportation and industrial sectors. We heard from Tesla earlier, uh, as electric vehicles do roll out, if nuclear is the, the source of energy that's being used to charge them up, then the, obviously the clean comes to, uh, through on both ends, both the electricity and transportation. All right? Appreciate it. All right. Uh, I was asked to say, well, okay, just because nuclear can do this, from a policy approach, why should nuclear be part of the mix? And I just wanted to highlight, probably less than a minute, a lot of people are familiar with it, why nuclear <coughs> should be part of the solution and why a lot of folks, including a lot of environmentalists today, say nuclear must be part of the solution because we can't get those goals met without nuclear. One, of course, is the clean air value. Nuclear does not emit any uh, greenhouse gases during operations. And on a life cycle basis, and if you include mining and manufacturing and everything else, it's on par uh, with renewables in that category. It's a reliable electricity. It operates seven days a week, 24 hours a day. It's also from a reliability from a fuel supply. You can load up a reactor and operate it for anywhere from 18 months to three or four years without ever having to replace fuel. So interrupting of gas supplies or coal supplies or oil supplies or anything else uh, would not affect that uh, once you're loaded into the reactor. Uh, it gives you economic power and it's stable in price over time. And economic, it's low cost in terms of the production cost, but even with the large upfront capital expenditures, that cost does not vary dramatically over the life of those reactors and it's not subject to the volatility. ASP in one of its recent reports said it's, it's almost as bad to have low prices that are subject to volatility than it is to have higher, higher prices that are stable. And that's true in terms of the economic effect uh, uh, for the public. All right. Um, <clears throat> overall, you do need diversity, though. Nuclear has a great niche for base load power. And also, I think for the newer plants, I'm going to talk about it briefly, SMRs, you can cycle and, re uh, uh, and load follow to some extent. They're being designed to do that. and there, But you're still going to need other things in the mix. The renewables uh, need to be there and then something to balance the renewables uh, a little bit better than nuclear can, maybe just peaking units with gas. If you could do that, you could probably get to the 80 to 90 percent reduction though in that category fairly easily. And economic job growth. Nuclear adds more jobs per thousand megawatts than any other technology we can use uh, to, put, uh, to, to produce power. And it has a multiplying effect throughout the nation. So think about it this way. If you're buying gas, and gas does increase to seven or eight or nine dollars a million BTUs, you're going to spend your, all your money out of the electricity cost you're paying for in just the, the gas commodity. But if you if you have the same total price and and seventy percent of it is in jobs, high paying jobs typically in the nuclear industry, that's a much greater benefit for the country and for the local regional areas where these plants are being built. All right. There's also national security issues on why we want to do nuclear, having the engineering expertise and been able to promote national policies externally uh, in other countries uh, through the, uh, uh, the nuclear programs. We will lose that if we don't uh, sustain uh, the nuclear programs we have now. I've also highlighted SMRs add additional benefits over those I just mentioned that nuclear adds. One, we can, we can load follow with a lot of these designs. We can do smaller incremental capital additions so that you're not putting so much at risk as you're trying to build these. We think we can cite them. Uh, we, we know we're planning and designing to cite them. But we should be able to, at the end of the day, cite them in more locations with less risk to the public in the locations where they're being distributed. And we think there'll be increased plant reliability because once you, if you were going to trip a unit and take it offline, you lose a very small percentage of the output compared to a large plant that could take down a whole, a large percentage of the power supply in any one region. New scale value proposition. 
All right. Um, simple, safe, and economic. This is an innovative design, but it uses <coughs> existing technology principles. It's a light water reactor. The Department of Energy and the Regulatory Commission have all said we're going to be able to deploy those based on current technology much faster and much more near term than some of the more uh, esoteric technologies like TerraPower, which a lot of people heard in the news. <coughs> so uh, we've taken that approach and we simplified it about as much as possible. Where a lot of plants use a lot of pumps and valves and different components, we have everything in an integral uh, module that can be built in a factory and it sits in a pool of water that provides us long-term cooling so you don't have to deliver it from any other remote location. We'll get into that. Um, it's also, uh, it's not a future R&D project anymore. It's near-term deployable. We have a customer right now that we're starting to develop a site for. We're submitting a license application to the regulator in 2016. We expect to have our first plant built by 2023 and then multiple plants built thereafter going forward. So that between the 2025 and 2035 decade, we can literally be building hundreds of these small uh, reactors in this country if we choose to. <coughs> and it is going to allow us to put power close to where it's needed um, in, in increments that are more needed. You can, if the load growth is only 100 megawatts in an area, it's hard to put a 1500 megawatt nuclear plant on the ground to meet that need. But when you have a plant such as ours, it's going to be easier to add incremental power. Real quick, that incremental power uh, really derived itself from DOE research programs initially. Back in 2000, we did a multi-application small light water reactor program uh, with Idaho National Lab. We were able to build a full-scale uh, startup facility. So think about it this way. If the government was just now going to start investing in new technologies for the future, we've already got a 10-year, 14-year head start on a number of those with work that has already been invested in uh, by this uh, country. Uh, we, we began NRC interactions early in 2008. Uh, we recently were announced as the winner of a Department of Energy funding opportunity announcement to sh cost share the uh, licensing of, of this new technology, and we are well into that process, as I mentioned. Uh, we've already spent about, on our side, about $215, $230 million to date. The cost share just kicked in beginning this year going forward, and we'll be sharing the cost for that licensing uh, work over the next couple of the next several years. I'm going to try to keep moving here. Oh, one more. All right. Uh, it's hard to have this behind you, so I'm sorry for the interruptions on that. Uh, what is our new scale power module? Well, this is a nice picture. Most of you can't see it, but it integral. It puts everything that is in the large reactor in separate components, the kind of they're operating today, into one module that can be built in a factory. That's the nuclear reactor steam generators, the pressurizer, and this is unique to our design, the containment that surrounds all that has to ensure that in the event of a postulated uh, accident of some type, it's contained within that containment building itself. It eliminates reactor coolant pumps, there's no force circulation, it eliminates large piping. As a matter of fact, that picture that's on the right hand side of your screen, which is one of six of these modules that might fit in, in a cutaway view of our reactor building, which is showing only half of where the ultimate 12 could be located. That's all the safety systems for the plant in that picture. Think about that compared to a larger nuclear plants that have multiple rooms with multiple pumps and multiple valves and multiple tanks and everything else. Ours is all located just in that, all of which can be built in the factory. That reactor building that has another side to it. We can add up to 12 of these modules. They're all 50 megawatts gross in size. The net output from that plant, if all 12 are built, would be 570 megawatts. So in some ways, it's like a larger plant. It could be 570 when you're done, but you can add them in smaller increments as you need them over a period of time so that you better match the load requirements that you're trying to meet on the system. Very, very neat idea. And that pool of water that you see in blue in that picture from a distance is the ultimate cooling for safety. So the, so the reactors and the containments are sitting in the water that it takes to cool them long term if you had to. I do it twice, I think. That's maybe the key. Alright. Alright. We rely on physics, like I mentioned earlier in the Tesla presentation. You know, physics control how much they can uh, improve their batteries right now, but physics is a reliable way to make sure that things work. It's worked for 
the history of our universe, right, in a certain way. And so we rely on no, like I said, new pumps to work. We rely on natural circulation. We use convection, conduction, and gravity, all of which are pretty reliable uh, <clears throat> features of our uh, physical systems. And, and that's, that's why, long term, we, we can meet this next requirement, which is what we call our triple crown of safety. And we announced this uh, last year. Uh, and a lot of folks have heard this, but if those of you who haven't, we can go indefinitely following any event with no operator action, no AC or DC power, and no additional water. Think about that in light of the Fukushima event, where the problem they had is they lost power, they couldn't power pumps, they ran out of water, they couldn't keep the reactor cool. In our case, it doesn't matter. Once the event happens, we have two valves that have to open to provide that natural circulation and physics to work. It's in the pool of water that it needs to maintain it cool. And if that ever were to run out, air is sufficient to cool it from there on. So it's a great, great, it's unique, great concept for this particular small module reactor. All right, this just gives you a relative perspective. I'm going to go through this real fast, but you can see, I didn't touch it. So I to um, why don't you change it? <laughs> All right. Uh, 126 of our modules with the containments around it could fit in one of the containment buildings for an AP1000, for example, for our current plant that's being built. That's a relative uh, size. The picture here just shows a fairly, I know it's a simplified diagram, but you don't get the big towers, the big, it looks like a, uh, where the condensation from cooling comes out of the towers and stuff. It looks almost like an office park uh, when it's done. Very clean. The reactor building is in the middle. You know, either wing or the turbine buildings where we would have six turbine generators on one side, six turbine generators on another side to produce the power that we're going to produce from all 12 modules. They all work independently of each other, which means that one of them can trip, the other 11 remain running. Or two could trip and the other 10 could remain running. So that's a nice feature of this is it's being designed to not share any of those systems, but to operate independent of each other. This is the last thing on the safety side I'm going to mention. This deals with emergency planning. Large plants have to have fairly large areas around the plant that they can evacuate the people from. Normally that's because they have three barriers for any release of radiation. Um, uh, the containment the, or the fuel cladding, the reactor vests, the containment. With the new scale design, we've got two additional barriers. We've got that pool of water that the reactor sits in, and we've got a reactor building surrounding that even, uh, in addition to that. <clears throat> and as a result of the small core size, because it's 1 20th the size of large reactors, and with, and, uh, with the design features of how safe it's, it's being designed and operated, with those additional barriers, we think we could actually limit the area where there would be risk to the public to the site boundary itself and not having to go any further than that. We will have to get the regulators approval of that, but we are obviously going to uh, propose uh, uh, that is in terms of our final design. There's a lot of areas around the country that doesn't matter, but there's a lot of areas where it would give us a lot more options and opportunities to deploy nuclear power uh, where it's needed. Right. So what does it mean? You know, there is a need. We need more aggressive uh, emissions reductions. Uh, nuclear is going to have to be part of that, or we're probably not going to come close to it. We have an innovative technology like ours. Uh, that we may not be the only one, but we certainly are one. To meet that need, and the technology can be deployed in time to start meeting that need. Matter of fact, we are already, as I said, working on projects to deploy by 2023. Many of you have heard our Western Initiative, uh, initiative in Nuclear, which is being led by a, a, a group of G&T and co-ops out of Utah called UAMPS. And the Energy Northwest has uh, agreed to be the operator of the, of the plants that are being built by that consortium. And we're looking at actually siting the very first plant at the Idaho National Labs Reservation. It'll be a, still a private enterprise. It won't be government owned. But we're looking at using that, that location to distribute the power to the member utilities that are going to be part of that project. Following that, we've got a line of sight on two other projects that the consortium may want to have uh, after that. And we've got other customers around the country that are excited about the opportunity that may follow suit. So again, the time frame we're thinking about is 2023, first, but then beyond that, multiple ones, multiple ones starting to be built. So what's, 
what else needs to be done? What, so the purpose of this presentation was to talk a little bit about policy, and I'll try to highlight some larger so we can follow up with the Q&As on some of these. Key challenges for any nuclear supplier, including us, going forward. A large, a large investment is required by a reactor vendor to design and license a plant. Uh, I, I loved it when Tesla said we could take that great innovative concept we had in three years, we could have it to market. That could take us four years to get the nuclear regulatory to even review what we're talking about and say it's okay. So it, it, there, are, there are some challenges on our side, but it also takes about a billion dollars to overcome that kind of thing because we essentially have to have everything designed and all questions answered that you could possibly ask about that before you can even start commercializing and deploying your product. So that billion dollar investment is a, is a steep challenge for a lot of folks. But right now, we have the investor that is willing to do that and move forward with it. And with the cost share that we got with DOE, that's, that helps us overcome that challenge quite a bit. Higher costs are first of a kind movers. These are the owners. One of the problems you have in the nuclear business, we haven't gotten very good at standardizing. Now that we're trying to standardize, it's still a lot higher cost for the first one or two that are going to be built. You have to do all your own licensing initially. You have to do the operating procedures. You have to do the maintenance procedures. You have to learn how to efficiently construct it. All those things add to that first time cost, which as you do multiple units over time, you get real good at. And think about this for a minute. To build the four AP1000s that are being built today, they're taking five years to, to build those, four to five years. That's four units. How much, how good do you get at building reactors with only four? To build that same number of megawatts using new scale reactors, we would be building 48. If you build 48, you get a lot better at it. You know? so, you can end up getting pretty good and having a good supply chain and enough practice at it by having these smaller ones also to meet that demand as you go forward. All right. The electricity, mar a higher co uh, the electricity market, I'm going to just highlight real quick two issues. We have competitive markets and we have regulated markets. The competitive markets don't work very well for any major capital investment. There's poor capacity markets in there, recover costs. And they're not really competitive because there's generation in those markets that are subsidized, renewables as an example, or mandated. There's also other power plants that were built under the old rules that are still getting favorable treatment. Or there's power plants being built outside of those competitive markets that can still sell their excess power into those markets. Those aren't really competitive markets when you're trying to look at it, but they discourage any major investment in new technology in those areas. All right. Bottom line, these are, I'm not gonna highlight all these, but the challenges, suggest ways that industry and policymakers and or government, states, national, can work together to not necessarily have to do it, but will certainly accelerate the process if they work together on it. And if we have to overcome the reduction in emissions and the time frame people are trying to make a difference, we are going to have to find ways to accelerate uh, these changes. All right. My next and final slide just about is uh, these are suggestions on things that can be done, some of which are already be done, like cost share on licensing. We talked about why that's necessary. But there's also final design engineering that's done one time for a standard plan uh, that could, could also come into play. Uh, we need, if we are going to set up streamlined manufacturing process, maybe in multiple states, if it's useful to do that, it'd be useful to have some way to help industry accelerate that process, or they'll wait until they build enough of before they even make the investment in. Tax credits are always good, <coughs> you can make them work. I know that's, that's difficult. They need to be transferable though if we do them this time because there's a lot of GNTs or nonprofits or others that produce electricity in this country that if they could partner with somebody that could take advantage of them, that would accelerate those investments even more uh, to make them happen. Uh, the renewable mandates uh, have worked and uh, within the states that have mandated them, they're good, and we're, and so we're not discouraging that. We just think nuclear is just as clean as renewables, and nuclear ought to be included with those requirements going forward. If we don't mandate it, at least level the playing field so we can all move them forward together. But <clears throat> I think that there's a way for both states and the national policymakers to uh, address that issue. And then long-term power purchase agreements can be done for federal facilities because we have goal at the federal level uh, to clean up the uh, both the Department of Energy laboratory sites as well as Department of Defense sites. We can set an example and promote new technology at the same time. It doesn't have to be choosing new scale. We can actually compete. Who can, uh, 
if, if we ask for people to put proposals in, that could meet 100% of your needs with clean energy, around the clock, and compete and, uh, that with against an SMR, I think we would come out very favorable, even with today's market conditions you talked about earlier, and that, because uh, they have to worry about uh, renewable uh, portfolio, they would have to do that, we have to worry about backup, we have to worry about the 7 by 24 we have to worry about a lot of other ways to ensure that the full requirements are met. Uh, so I believe we, would, we, can, we can compete quite favorably with that. But it's okay to have some plants and sites supplied by completely renewables if that works and they can do that, and others supplied by SMRs, let's promote both technologies. Like I said, we're going to need an all of the above strategy if we're going to come close to reducing the emissions uh, in the long term. So that's all I have, and uh, we'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you, uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, our next speaker, I, I guess we'll do Keith Bradley uh, next. Uh, Keith is with Argonne National Laboratories, and where he's a, a program leader and senior technical advisor uh, for national and global security programs. Um, meaning, I think that Keith works with scientists and engineers and managers there in the engineering, uh, energy engineering systems analysis across the lab to discuss. Uh, issues involving global security. Before uh, that, Keith was a physicist and technical director in the nuclear engineering division of the lab, and he's involved, been involved with the U.S. Department of Energy's Office of Nuclear Energy for many years. Uh, you had also been at Lawrence Livermore and Los Alamos uh, studying the physics of nuclear weapons, so you have experience, obviously, on the, on, on the energy as well as the weapons side of uh, nuclear energy. Um, and you're going to talk to us, I believe, about some security issues that, that face us uh, as we talk about uh, advanced nuclear energy power. Thank you. Hello? Okay, very good. Thank you. So, um, you know, the first thing you might be asking is, is why is there a physicist from a national laboratory sitting on this panel? And um, I want to start by telling you a little bit about our um, so Argonne is very proud, and in fact, maybe even a little boastful, in the fact that we invented nuclear energy. Um, and uh, in fact, we don't rest on our laurels. Even today, we're working on the technology that we believe will be adopted in the decades to come. Um, and so if you take a look at this graph, and I don't expect you to be able to uh, absorb anything from it in this venue, uh, what we've represented here is are the different types of reactors that we've either designed and or tested or fielded. And it's not an exaggeration to say that just about every reactor that's operating today, as well as most of them in the past, can tie their origins to an argon design. So we obviously have this heritage of designing nuclear energy systems, uh, and we continue doing that today. All right, so that's civilian nuclear energy. But what I really want to talk about is energy security. And as it was explained a moment ago, I spent most of my career in national security uh, surrounding nuclear, but not limited to that. And, and I wanted to dispel some myths that I think that my community have. We hear a lot about energy security, and of course that's why we're all gathered here today. Um, but people think of, when they hear security, they think of physical protection. So what I want to say is that energy security is about a lot more than simply protecting the energy source, the power plant, if you will. We have to get past that thinking. Uh, and I think that probably the community in this room is actually very much there. But the broader community is, when they hear national security, they really think physical protection. Um, I have a colleague, I like to borrow his phrase, but what we really are interested in, what we're doing, is we're talking about energy confidence. Okay, and why, why is that important? It's because our society today depends critically on energy supply. Everything we do is totally tied to the uh, plentiful energy, reliable, affordable energy. You know, if you disrupt that energy supply, you disrupted transportation, clean water, agriculture, telecommunications, the banking system, everything is interrelated. And so you have to really think of energy supply and energy availability as an ecosystem. It's not simply just protecting the source of the energy. That's what we mean by energy security. <clears throat> so, I don't expect you to be able to read this, but I'll point something out that I think is really interesting. Naturally, you would expect a physicist to claim the 
the technology dominates emission reductions, which is one of, of course, one of our big challenges that we face today. One of those connectivities I mentioned, of course, was the impact on climate of producing energy the way we do today and tomorrow. Um, I'd like you to focus your attention on the column on the far right, the bar chart, uh, and you'll notice that the top five bars represent the dominant source of this number. This number represents the amount of carbon reduction in the atmosphere by mechanism, okay? So the top five clearly dominate all of the reduction around the globe. Three of those five are technology driven. This is a chart that was recently put out by The Economist. Um, and number three is actually nuclear. So certainly policy is very important. In fact, the top bar was, which is actually a policy, the Montreal Protocol, was enabled by technology. In the absence of technology advancement, the Montreal Protocol would not have worked. So the message is, technology is the solution. Policy is important, but it's there in order to enable a technological solution. So I want to tell you a little bit about how national laboratories like Argonne advance, advance energy security, and in particular in this venue, nuclear security. So we've all heard it before, and it's certainly very true, that there is no substitute for experience. I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation that Argonne is 30 years ahead. This experimentation that we have here at Argonne was designed to understand the consequences of a nuclear core belt. And immediately after Fukushima, this facility became critically important in understanding what was happening in real time at that plant in Japan. But we didn't wait to build this facility and to start fielding the facility after the event. We had this in place, the US government invested in building this capability, and was immediately on the scene for understanding the consequences and how to mitigate them, which of course is equally or even more important. This is an example of a facility that's added a lot of value to understanding and advancing nuclear power, but it's not one that would necessarily make sense for industry to build. So they're benefiting by the U.S. government investment in understanding the safety of the systems that they want to feel they want to commercialize. And the people from around the world come to Argonne Laboratory to use facilities like this that were built with government dollars. We're also using modern computing technology. We live in an era now where almost nothing will be developed without the use of powerful computing. Your toothbrush is designed with a computer, tested with a computer, um, and, it's, and it's very ubiquitous throughout the community, throughout the developing community, not only in nuclear, but everywhere. But it's one thing to use uh, what we call commodity class computing to do design, and it's another thing entirely to use the world's fastest and most powerful computers to explore things that may be difficult or impossible to explore doing experiments alone. So national laboratories have in particular focused a considerable amount of effort developing supercomputing capabilities to explore those phenomena that are critical for advancing things such as nuclear power. Again, this is another example of where it probably wouldn't be cost effective for any particular company to uh, invest in building this capability, but by coming to the government and using the capabilities that we've built at the national laboratories, we can add value and, and improve the bottom line for industry by leveraging this investment. And in fact, I want to point out that uh, we have an agreement with NuScale uh, to actually use our scientific computing capability to validate some of their their beliefs about how the uh, natural circulation of new scale design is in fact inherently <clears throat> Finally, I want to address energy storage a bit. Um, you know, there was a, the last panel uh, was about how to enable clean transportation, and of course that was focused in large part on energy storage. And I had mentioned, if those of you who might have been here earlier, I had mentioned that there's a lot of battery research going on around the Department of Energy complex. Um, but it's important to note, and it was noted on the last panel, that if you're charging those batteries with dirty energy, 
you may not be achieving a lot when it comes to controlling the climate. And so um, nuclear is an obvious example of where we can really transform uh, transportation through energy storage. And that, that makes it that makes uh, batteries a, a key element of moving out nuclear beyond sending electricity to your home, for example. Uh, there's another way in which batteries, in fact, um, can enable nuclear. And that is uh, what we call load following. Certainly there are designs on the books at uh, optimized to control the amount of power that's produced in a nuclear reactor so that you're producing only the power that you need at the moment. Uh, but most of today's, in fact all of today's reactors don't operate on that premise. Uh, certainly New Scale and other companies are exploring ways to do that, but one possible way of doing that is adding energy storage to traditional design so that you store the energy when you're not using it and that helps uh, level the load that the reactor is producing at the moment. And finally, I just want to point out that, uh, once again, as a physicist, I'm going to claim you cannot create energy. You can only convert it. Uh, we think of batteries as being energy storage. It's certainly not the only uh, form of energy storage. In fact, biofuels, the topic of the last uh, panel, is a form of energy storage. Uh, the reason we're still burning uh, fossil fuels and petroleum in our cars is because it's really difficult to beat that storage, energy storage of a, of a molecule. You know, breaking those bonds produce, uh, produces a lot of energy and uh, the biofuels concept is, is a recognition that you can still store a lot of energy in a molecule in some ways better than you can in a battery or a capacitor. So I don't think we're going to get away from that anytime soon. It's a very efficient way of uh, taking uh, novel energy capabilities and, and making them useful in transportation. So the message I'm hoping you'll take away is that, you know, when we say energy security, what I think we mean is we mean energy confidence. And today, by energy confidence, we really mean resilience. We need a diversified portfolio of energy sources and all of the above solution so that we can be certain that we're resilient possibly one or the other sectors is at risk. So how are we going to do that? Well, first of all, we need to break down the silos. We can't have scientists working in a corner somewhere and having those solutions sitting on a shelf somewhere that never see the light of day. We obviously have to work with industry because they're the ones who are going to commercialize these solutions. And finally, this is a global problem. It's not something that we can do only here in the US. Uh, and we need to find a mechanism we're bringing the entire community together to solve these big problems. And big problems, in fact, are what they are. Uh, when you are siloed, you tend to tackle elements of a problem. And that's not the complete solution. We have to bring these all together for the complete solution. Finally, um, it's very possible to develop solutions that aren't deployable. And the only way you're certain that the solutions you're developing are deployable are to engage end users from the beginning. This is a lesson that we're learning at the national laboratories in real time. Uh, it's one of the reasons we're eager to reach out to the commercial sector, work closely with them, so that we're certain that what we're doing with government investment is actually changing the enterprise in positive ways. That's it. Great. <clears throat> Thank you, Keith. Uh, we're going to move on to uh, Mark Haynes, last but not least. Uh, Mark is president of Concordia Power which is a consulting firm that has an emphasis on advanced fission and fusion energy development. Mark formed Concordia Power after serving for 14 years as Vice President for General Atomics, uh, where his chief responsibilities were in the areas of advanced fission, fusion, and the nuclear fuel cycle. He also worked for Fluor Corporation, and since we're in DC, we can't forget to mention that uh, you were at one time a staff member of the US Senate Committee on Environment and Public Works. Go ahead. Thank you very much. You neglected to mention that Keith uh, is a plasma physicist, so he'll be on the next panel. <laughs> <laughs> you can ask hard questions from the audience. <laughs> um, uh, when I was in college, and, and Bill, that was only a couple of years ago, <laughs> just, just so you know, but I had a girlfriend who, who had a, a bumper sticker on her car that said, uh, nuclear power, buy now, pay later. And I think about that uh, bumper sticker. Uh, because it was exactly wrong. 
because the reality is it's uh, if we don't invest heavily in nuclear power, particularly now and what's going on in the world, we're going to pay and pay and pay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about, uh, since we're at the American Security Project, uh, talk about the need, in the, primarily the need in the national security sense for uh, reviving, and I do mean reviving in this country, nuclear power, because it's sort of more of them right now, uh, and I'm more specifically talk about why advanced reactors uh, are important. And then I'm, I'll talk about uh, the barriers, some of the barriers that are there, and that'll echo a little bit of what Jack said, and <coughs> some of the possible solutions um, to that. First, um, let me see, everybody has to check their slides. And this is a totally useless slide. <laughs> but uh, if you could really see that, what you'd see are some useless diagrams, really an out-of-date diagrams, really about uh, advanced reactors. And these are six of the sort of primary of these so-called the Gen 4 reactors. But there are other types out there, and there are variations of these reactors. But they're, just real briefly, they're high-temperature gas cool reactors, sodium fast reactors, uh, molten salt, and that, well, I won't go there. Uh, fast gas reactors, uh, supercritical water reactors, and uh, lead and lead bismuth reactors. And each, this topic is really broad and deep, but uh, suffice it to say that these are very different, all of them from today's reactors, and that each of these reactor types have their own components that, that, that support them with almost uh, religious fervor. It's a, it's a remarkable thing, a beautiful thing. So let me try and talk about briefly some commonalities without getting into a lot of detail. And some of the commonalities are that each of these kinds of reactors, they all operate at higher temperatures than today's reactors, and that's very important. I'm going to come back to that point in a minute. Uh, for the, uh, because of the higher temperatures, they are all more thermally efficient. So for every amount of nuclear heat produced, you get more electric power out of them. That's important. And you get less waste heat fed into the environment. That's nice. Uh, also, sort of relatedly, for other reasons, they have uh, just on because of that, probably better fuel utilization. Uh, some of them have the ability to burn spent fuel or depleted uranium. Uh, some of them would excel at burning uh, thorium, which is a, a fuel that is much more plentiful around the world than, than uranium. Some of them have a superior safety case. They're certainly all different safety cases uh, than, than reactors of today. Some of them can be made quite small for remote locations. And then uh, some of them may turn out to have better economics, but a lot of that sort of remains to be seen. What this doesn't mean is that uh, uh, that any or all of these ought to replace or will replace at any time in the near future light water reactors, either the big ones or the SMRs that are coming along, nor uh, does it mean that they, they should uh, or that any one of these will ultimately own the world. That's sort of like in a nuclear energy or that uh, to golf or nuclear power plants to golf clubs. It is a huge game out there and you're going to need a lot of different kinds of clubs to play the game. So, uh, you know, there are years going on what I call reactor wars, but there's no need because there's plenty of room for all these kinds of reactors and, and for the diversity they bring. It's sort of a beautiful thing. Uh, now for a moment of disclosure, and maybe a little bit of religious fervor, uh, but not much. Uh, I work for something called the Next Generation Nuclear Plant Industry Alliance, and it's peopled by these companies. And uh, you see a couple of end users potential end users there, Dow Chemical and uh, ConocoPhillips and also the Petroleum Technology Alliance of Canada, all are interested in, in HDGRs for uh, a, a reason. These react, H, our members, all of our members believe that HDGRs are probably the, or really are the most near term of all of the Gen 4 reactors, probably certainly in this country, uh, maybe the most licensable. Uh, you might disagree, I don't know. We, uh, uh, they have um, a, an extraordinary safety case, and because they can operate ultimately at very high temperatures, they have a, uh, and it, it, they can be extremely versatile and useful as a source of industrial uh, heat. And uh, to um, put a little finer point on what Jack said, I think this is from the uh, Energy Information Administration. I'm going to stand up for a second. And, th and this single slide, if, if you haven't seen this, you can go to EIA's website. It is the best 
single piece of education on, on energy that it's, it's, a, it's a nice thing. But one, a couple of things you'll see. One, for electric power, where notwithstanding the last panel on, on uh, transportation, really it's all the battle about renewables and nuclear and stuff seems to be about electric power. But the reality is electric power is the least carbon intensive of all of the, the four sectors represented here. In fact, because of hydro, because of renewables, and because of nuclear, it's only about uh, 60 some high 60 percent uh, uh, carbon intensive, but the others uh, uh, are about 90 percent, 90 percent plus. And as was pointed out in transportation, you know, cars are uh, renewable transportation is nibbling away a little bit of that. But you know, you've got airplanes to deal with, you've got uh, uh, trains, you've got a lot of other things that are uh, probably going to require liquid fuels for a long time. The other, the other thing that's interesting here uh, uh, is that if you'll notice, <clears throat> excuse me, electric power, if 100% of that goes, or excuse me, nuclear power, 100% of that goes to the electric power uh, sector. And so in that sense, yeah, well, look, nuclear right now, it's kind of a one-trick pony, except as it's starting to leak over into the uh, transportation sector. So with regard to height, and, and the reason for nuclear LWRs being sort of confined to that role primarily is because of the low temperatures. But what's interesting is you get up into the higher temperature ranges, and again, it's a little bit of an eye chart back to be sure. You start being able to do some interesting things with heat, and particularly in this case, nuclear heat. You get up into the ability to uh, assist in, in, in taking carbon out of petroleum refining and taking the carbon out of getting oil sands uh, out of the ground and uh, processing that. Uh, Co-generation of electric and steam, and then on up into the sort of the crown jewel of energy in a sense. It's a common point in a lot of things, which is hydrogen. You can make hydrogen without a carbon. You really, uh, you've got an extraordinary thing. So I want to go back. Having said that, I want to go back and uh, talk about, in general, why nuclear again. And this will echo uh, some things Jack said. It's concentrated. It's reliable base load power. It uh, doesn't depend on the weather. It doesn't eat up a lot of land. It's safe from the uh, uh, um, occupational safety record and from the point of view of public safety, it is second to none, notwithstanding Fukushima and Chernobyl. Uh, it's plentiful, uh, particularly when you, uh, you know, rain, there's a lot of uranium out there. If you, if you got to seawater, the Japanese are actually looking at uh, seawater uh, question and, and doing research in that. But if you go to advanced fuel cycles and advanced reactors and thorium, there's a lot of it for a long time with nuclear. And of course, there are no emissions. But there's another way of looking at nuclear, and that's from the uh, public policy perspective. And you know, why should nations be interested in, in, in being leaders in nuclear energy? And I think, in a way, that's the more interesting question. So there's a number of reasons there. There's internal energy security has been talked about. There's meeting environmental goals, for example, international emissions goals. There's exports, balance of trade kind of issues. There's entry into other nations' energy markets, which is kind of relation, related to the balance of trade. There's the support and the building of the internal, uh, your high-tech industry. Nuclear is extraordinarily high technology. The jobs are good. The going out into advanced reactors, it pushes out some technology and materials issues. That's good. And then, as important, maybe more important than the others, is that if you have a strong nuclear power industry, if you're a sort of a blowing and going in that, then you have a real legitimate say in, in non-proliferation negotiations and safeguards and security. You've got your people out there in the world, and that's important. And I'll tell you, that's something we were losing in the United States, and that's a, a very Key point that gets out to tech really gets to the heart of the uh, uh, don't buy now, I'm going to pay and pay later sort of thing that I was saying. And, and those reasons are the reasons why every major country in the world that's a nuclear power either, either owns their industry outright, and that's in the case of Russia, China, uh, France are the major players there, or they have fully subsidized their industry, and that's uh, Japan and Korea are in that, in that category. Right now, there are 30 countries in the world that have nuclear power plants. And the EIA uh, uh, 
has said that about 60 more of those they've approached, uh, excuse me, I mean the IAEA, with the acronyms. Uh, the IAEA has been approached by about 60 countries in recent years about the possibility of going nuclear, and the IAEA estimates that about 15 of those new countries will go nuclear, with meaning nuclear power, in the next decade or so. So uh, this is a very important strategic point. It's also a very important point of view of energy in, uh, around the world. So from our nation's economy and, or insecurity, I, I think it's a whole lot better to be in this game and, and, uh, with more than one kind of club, if you will, golf club, if you will. And so related to that, and golf clubs, uh, here's why uh, an aggressive program on advanced reactors is important. And, uh, this slide sort of says it all. This is from a CIS, recent CSI report. And you'll note that the two big wedges here, as you know, you can't see in the back, uh, this is the US here in purple, this tiny 7% wedge. Russia, 37%. China, 28%. That's the reactor number of reactors being built by those countries, both externally and internally. And, it, and in fairness, uh, there are Westinghouse reactors being built in China now that contributes to that wedge. But Russia is primarily, uh, they're already building reactors in other countries, and China will be uh, almost without a doubt exporting reactors soon. They're learning very quickly. So Gen 4 reactors or advanced reactors are very important, but um, and there are numerous country companies in the United States that are uh, a new scale being one of them. Uh, not that it's a Gen 4 per se, but it's a, a good example. You know, that are ready, that have technologies ready, that are trying to get these technologies to market, and in the case of advanced reactors, finish up the development work and so on. And But it you can't do it, and there are barriers to that. And uh, there are ways that the government can help. So let me quickly go through some barriers. Jack did this a little bit. Uh, the low cost of natural gas is one of them. I think it's one of the biggest barriers. It makes it, it, it eliminates the pull uh, for that, a, a lot of it. Yeah, nuclear is a very large capital investment uh, up front, no matter what kind of reactor you've got. It's a long-term payoff. Uh, it'll be from the time you've got your first one in the ground and operating, when you ultimately make a payoff on that investment, it's probably 15, 15 years or so. Would you say 10 to 15 years? A long time. Uh, there's a deregulated utility structure, Jack. I talked about that, that has to think very, very short term. There is a long and extensive, complex, and somewhat unpredictable regulatory process, particularly in the case of the Gen 4 advanced reactors. Uh, there are arguably, as was pointed out, more generous subsidies for other sources, particularly the renewables right now. And the other thing, which is a more subtle factor, is that I think our government, because a lot of this help is going to simply have to come from the government. But our government, particular government, is almost ashamed to be seen in public with nuclear and doesn't really know how to work uh, with nuclear now. And uh, the real case in point of that is that Bill Gates, the richest guy in the world, certainly in the US maybe, um, has a reactor. Terra Power was mentioned briefly before. Uh, he invested several tens of millions in it. And he's gone overseas. He's gone to China to try and get this thing developed because, as I understand it, basically too hard to do in the United States. So Bill Gates, he has to do it, wow. Uh, tools at the government's disposal to uh, help this, uh, more money in the case of advanced reactors, more money for reactor uh, r and research, development, design, uh, licensing support, uh, federal, uh, federal site could be provided or sites could be provided that you know, something like uh, price supports or something like that. Uh, power or purchase power purchase agreements, uh, loan guarantees, and just uh, it came out today. The department has issued a uh, a loan guarantee. I guess right, it's an F, is an F RFP in that sense. Is that? It's a solicitation for a solicitation. Yeah. Yeah. Was twelve billion? Is that what I said? Anyway, but that's so. There's some movement on that front for any kind of advanced reactor. The government could become better at partnering with uh, industry in a number of ways, um, design, construction, demonstration. It could also relax a 50-50 uh, 
posture and requirement, which is very daunting. And it could also help internationally in, in, brokering, uh, in brokering deals. I've got this right side up. Uh, you can definitely not set, see this. I went back and looked at some headlines, or found some headlines that sort of make this point a little bit about uh, what's going on in the world and where's the U.S. But a lot of this is an ode to the fact that the Chinese and the Russians are out wheeling and dealing in all kinds of uh, countries. It's a, a little bit, a little bit sobering. Uh, my favorite is uh, uh, headline is uh, a nuclear Bolivia. Why not? Uh, but I'll leave you with this final slide, which is. It's two pictures. One is the uh, Chinese pebble bed or HDGR, which is being constructed right now. It's due to go online in 2016, and the Chinese will uh, uh, have said if it's successful, and it's likely to be. It's a well-known technology in a sense; it's been around. Uh, that they're going to build at least 16 more of these, and you can bet your bottom dollar that they will be exporting these these reactors. The other picture is of a Russian sodium fast reactor BN 800 which is their latest version. They're also building a scaled-up version of that. And right now, as I understand it, the Russians are in China helping the Chinese with their fast gas, or excuse me, with their sodium gas pool, sodium fast reactor design. So things are moving very quickly, and we do not have, I think as a country, a lot of, a lot of uh, time to sort of mess around. We need to get on with this. That's all. Great, thank you, um, and thank all of our panelists. Uh, I think we've had a very interesting overview of some things that are happening in the advanced nuclear energy space. And I think it sets us up perfectly to talk a little bit about uh, policy questions that have been raised and perhaps get into them in a little more depth, as well as some business-related uh, questions. Um, I'm gonna start out with just a couple questions which I'm gonna throw out to the panel, and then uh, we'll be going to the audience for questions in a few minutes. Um, I guess I wanna go back to the uh, DOE draft solicitation, which did come out this morning. I think it's a topical issue that uh, DOE has said it has uh, $12.5 billion in loan guarantee authority, which it's uh, proposing to use for nuclear energy projects. Two billion of that apparently is gonna be for front end, uh, basically enrichment or conversion or possibly fuel fabrication projects. The remaining 10.5 billion is thrown out to nuclear energy projects. Uh, the way the solicitation is uh, phrased, because I read it just before coming over here. Uh, it seems like they're opening up to more than the previous solicitation, which was a pretty determinedly large reactor with innovative sort of advanced characteristics. This new one is talking about, specifically says advanced reactors, meaning not advanced reactors the way you think of them, I think, but reactors that have some improvement over the existing fleet. So they may have, for, for example, passive safety systems such as the AP-1000 and the SBWR. And they also specifically call out small modular reactors, as Jack will be happy to hear. They also provide, for the first time, uh, an opportunity for uh, companies to go to the government to seek loan guarantees to provide uh, capacity increases at existing plants. And so you can imagine that some uh, cash-strapped uh, uh, nuclear operator might be going looking to the government for money for that, and um, that's going to be an interesting scenario. So I want to ask, is this, this is an example of what the government can do, and I think most people would welcome it, but is it going to really have any impact on advanced reactors, or is it still looking at helping the existing fleet and the existing designs that have already you know, been licensed by NRC? What do, what do we think about that? Let's start. Yeah. Uh, loan guarantees are, uh, it's encouraging to see that the government is willing to put loan guarantees out there. The history uh, so far of the industry, though, has been that they don't really help a lot compared to other things the government might do. And the reason is, and this may not be commonly understood by a lot of folks, <clears throat> if you are in a competitive market, for example, and, have, and want to go after a loan guarantee to build a nuclear plant, that's seen as a risky investment, and the government will charge you money for that loan guarantee, sometimes, which would equal the cost of capital you might be able to go achieve on your own. So in that case, it would have little uh, support for what you're trying to do from an overall economic point of view. <clears throat> I think that the current one will uh, benefit potentially the AP-1000, the ESPWR, as was mentioned, because they are already licensed. AP-1000 is ready to construct today. 
So guess, guess who might go after more loan guarantees is the guy already built ones, like Southern Company, who announced they like to do more than the two they're doing right now. But will it stimulate a lot of the SMRs, for example? Well, SMRs have not even submitted their license applications yet. So the construction decision for any utility going to build one is probably not until 2016-17 time frame. So by that time, if the SBWR and the AP1000 do go after the loan guarantee money and they are so successful in getting it, um, there may not be any left <laughs> by the time an SMR comes around and want to use it. So it's great, as I said, the fact that the government is stepping up to say we have something available to support and move this forward we need to encourage that, because we've talked about there's all kinds of ways we need more support as we go forward. But this particular, the timing of this particular one for SMRs in particular, uh, is probably not going to be really useful for us unless nobody uses it until the time we need it. It's still available. Uh, ditto. Yeah. <laughs> we, we have two of our companies in our alliance, so Westinghouse and Areva. Uh, I have, you know, this is all very new. Well, no doubt. I'll, I'll bet this, but I think the answer is ditto. Like this. Um, another another question. It's interesting that uh, all of you discussed uh, nuclear power for an hour, and there was very little discussion of waste or waste disposal. And I think that really we have to ask you to address that question. Uh, because some people would argue that uh, the, the nuclear waste is is one of the biggest uh, security issues that nuclear energy has. And so maybe, maybe we can start out with any, any thoughts about what's being done on the waste front, how uh, the government and labs and, uh, and private industry are addressing, addressing what uh, I should probably be referring to as, as spent fuel or used fuel. I know you guys don't like waste. <laughs> you want me to take a stand? Um, I, I did mention it in the sense that there are uh, reactor types out there that make the claim, and the reality is they will be able to burn spent fuel so there's another reality, though, and no matter what reactor technology you have um, or fuel cycle or whatnot, there's always going to be some waste at the end. There is no doubt about it. There's going to be some there, and it's going to maybe be less long-lived, perhaps, than what we have today, and maybe a lesser amount, but there'll always be a need for an ultimate repository uh, for spent fuel. The other thing to be said about it, or a couple of more things, is that... Um, so, you know, one, the NRC basically recently has made the determination on uh, um, waste assurance uh, that, um, in essence, it's fine where it is. And in reality, it is, it's fine where it is at, at LWR sitting there. It's in incredibly robust uh, containers. It's monitored. It's above ground. You can see what's going on. But the other thing in the case of some of these advanced reactors, and I'll speak the one I know the best, which is HTGRs, the waste itself, you create somewhat less of it, and it's less, to some extent, create less of it per amount of electric power you would generate, and because there's better fuel utilization, but it goes to the ultimate repository in a much better package. It's already heavily ceramically clad. So uh, that's a, you know, is an improvement, marginal improvement, but again, nuclear will never get away from the, the fact that there's always going to be the need for this ultimate disposal. Keith, are the labs doing anything that, that you're involved with on this front? Certainly. Um, so there are a couple things I'd like to say about that. First of all, um, as Mark pointed out, uh, the recent decision that we can store uh, used nuclear fuel in place is obviously very beneficial. Uh, it is, in fact, a security risk, but uh, at least for fresh used nuclear fuel, it's not that much of a security risk because, in point of fact, you really can't handle it very well. Um, the other point I want to, and in fact, the, the national laboratories are researching ways of storing it above ground until the nation figures out what they want to ultimately do. Certainly, we will eventually need some type of repository. But if we adopt a fuel cycle that uses most of the energy in the uranium, uh, it's important for the public to understand that the volume of that repository will be very small. Very small. You know, the Yucca Mountain experience is not going to be experience in the future, hopefully not politically, certainly not in terms of technical challenges. Um, finally, I want to point out that um, you know, to adopt a fuel cycle, to use a, a, a fast spectrum reactor, that is a reactor that burns uh, much of the fuel and leaves behind uh, many fewer isotopes of concern uh, for storage, 
We've been working on that a long time in this country. The National Laboratories, not only in Oregon, but others, have had concepts, we've tested them, they're safe. Uh, we're currently working with the Koreans uh, to help implement their fast reactor system. And uh, it's not a pipe dream. I mean, this technology has been in place for decades. And uh, the solution to uh, eliminating the waste or the used nuclear fuel is as much a political one as it is anything else. And that, that brings me to sort of the last question, which is, you know, we're here in D.C. in, a, in a, an environment in which uh, even Republicans are, 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 are retreating from their support of, of, certain, of, 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 of financial incentives for, for nuclear energy. And so it seems a very challenging time to be going out asking for loan guarantees, for tax credits, for a huge increase in research spending, for public-private partnerships even to develop uh, next-generation nuclear plants. What, what, what is the industry, what are you guys uh, trying to do to try and, and, and work in that kind of environment? You try to, you try to um, spread the risk between people that believe that the future will eventually have a market price for electricity that will sustain uh, easily these investments, even though they're long-term investments, uh, more than today's does. You may invest a little bit slower if that if the case is that the government does not support in any way investments in these technologies. Uh, you may look at other markets that where the dynamics are more favorable. Uh, we talked about in the very first presentation this morning that natural gas prices are not four dollars everywhere in the world. In some places they're double or triple that amount, and therefore those markets you know are much more competitive from a total price of electricity and a total price to produce with with nuclear today. Um, but our, our ability to have the low cost we have today, the gas where it is, will not last forever. And the, the real forecasting issue for most people, including uh, the utilities that we interact with, is one, what is their need for power? What is their need to transition from their existing type of generation? If they're heavy coal today, that risk is huge in and of itself. And two, what do they think that transition point is going to be for higher gas? or more volatile gas, even if it's not sustained higher, uh, that could hurt their customers in the future. And would they like to hedge that with investments nearer term to, to offset that? So we're focusing on those markets and those customers. Some of them can get in those markets earlier. They're GNTs or, or they have low cost of capital sources, for example. They can borrow money at uh, very, very low interest rates. And they're going to have to invest in something anyway in a big way so uh, this is one of the choices they think uh, looks good. It was mentioned earlier, somebody over on that side, I can't remember who it was, but uh, during the uh, renewables panel <clears throat> about uh, what are the virtues of going Europe, uh, partnering with Europeans, uh, maybe by coincidence. Uh, so again, I work for this Next Generation Nuclear Plant Industry Alliance, which is an amalgam of a number of kind of end users and technology companies and utility and so on. There is a European group that's quite the analog, uh, same thing. Europe's called NC2I, Next Generation, or, or Nuclear Cogeneration Industrial Initiative. And we have, uh, in fact, our proto website has been live today. We have something called uh, the, the, the uh, Gemini Initiative, which is uh, a partnership between our two alliances and the concept that we're uh, starting to push on together is that the U.S. and the European governments join together along with uh, sort of a, uh, a mixture of U.S. and European industry to push high temperature gas cooled reactor commercialization forward but specifically the, uh, the breadth of the initiative is to work together to uh, finish final development select a, uh, hopefully select the same design for both the U.S. and EU and uh, to uh, complete a design. And the advantage is, and then each country sort of decides how to go forth and, and build the reactor and where to build it on their own. The advantages of that, just real briefly, are uh, pooling the uh, technical resources for that. Uh, uh, since it will require, require government money, it will buy down the cost to each government, uh, but then it also uh, greatly increases the market uh, because there's a, a, both a 
potentially a very large demand in the US and EU for these reactors for industrial heat and, and other purposes. So that's one thing that we've tried to do to get around this problem. Great. I want, I want to address it from a different perspective, getting back to the energy security comment or the question we're here to address. Um, you know, there's an axiom that is that the world is going to continue to adopt nuclear, whether the US takes it seriously or not. I, uh, I enjoyed once years ago hearing Madeleine Albright on the radio say that you know, foreign policy is about trying to convince others to do what's in our best interest. And so if we want to have an impact on the rest of the world adopting nuclear both safely and securely, we have to be doing it here at home. And I think that's a very compelling argument why the U.S. government needs not only to invest in the government and the national laboratories pursuing this research, but it has to empower the commercial sector to do it. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to have an impact on how the rest of the world adopts nuclear energy. Okay, well, it's time to uh, throw the, this, this panel to the audience, so to speak. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm looking for any questions. If you have a question, I think just raise your hand. And if I signal to you, I think you can just stand up and say it. This is a small room. I don't know if there's a microphone. But uh, yeah, there is. There is a microphone, so you can step to the mic or just yell really loud. Any questions out there? Yeah, right here in the, on the aisle. Thanks. Yeah, hi, my name is Creighton Jones with 21st Century Science and Technology. Uh, my question, I guess initially, was directed towards Mr. Bailey, but it has broader implications. Number one, in terms of security, one of the greatest threats we have right now is water security. If you look at the drought, California, Texas also affects food security. So on the question of the use of nuclear power for uh, desalination, just wondering if there are, from your company, are there designs that incorporate that into the equation? I guess number one, and I guess broadly, what is the role that nuclear power can play in addressing that crisis? And I guess secondly, specifically for you and more broadly, what is the current manufacturing capacity in terms of what we could, if we, if the bills went through and everything say green light, how much can we actually produce in our current uh, manufacturing capacity? Thanks. All right, I'll start with the best maybe. The, uh, we have looked at a, we haven't done detailed engineering, but we have looked at the application of our technology to desalinization. It could be used. Some of the other technologies, the higher temperature ones and others, could probably uh, do that also, if not better. But ours does have that ability to be used that way. It's not our lead uh, application commercially, though. We are proceeding to use the electric generation and licensing as the main business perspective, but we do have uh, a person in our organization working with others on what those other applications might turn out to be and when would be the right time to start pursuing. Because the basic technology doesn't change, where do you apply the heat and the other things, uh, and what do you combine it with uh, in the process? Uh, so, so that's the means. Current manufacturing capability specifically to ours is uh, very minimal. Although the good news is, you know, because ours is so small, uh, whereas the large reactors have all had to move to foreign countries to uh, do the four genes and the large reactor components and steam generators and other large components, all of ours could can be manufactured in the US. And we are talking to suppliers that do that kind of work over here now. Part of what we're doing as part of developing the business is we're looking for partnering with those that want to do a whole lot of that uh, to sustain uh, you know, our development and then expand them or expand in states where the states have strong support for what we're trying to do also. It wouldn't take long to ramp up because valves are small and the valves are typically readily available. We're trying to commercialize to where you can use off-the-shelf type components. The new part would be the reactor module itself but because it can be uh, <clears throat> Designed, fabricated, built, manufactured all in the U.S. We think that's going to be a role. Good questions. Um, certainly having. Uh, I just, I, I think Jack said it right. The higher temperature, you know, LWRs to do desalination, uh, uh, either reverse osmosis, you know, tank for it with electric power or distillation, and I think the more modern desal plants are a, a combination of those two uh, technologies. 
But uh, so you can use nuclear heat and you can use nuclear electricity. And uh, he's, he's right, the higher the temperatures you go with reactors, the better you can use both of those things. Basically, and use it as a or as a bonding cycle. Um, maybe more interestingly, I would make the argument that if you want to do desalination on a massive scale uh, in a no carbon way, you have to have nuclear. It's hard to conceive of places like California or the Middle East where it's very arid. You can't grow. You don't have the land. You can't don't have the water to grow the crops. You know, you got to have a concentrated source of low water type of energy that the land use to do it. So nuclear is the natural for that. So good, very good question. And sort of a similar answer with regard to manufacturing capability uh, for the advanced reactors, but they're, you know, it's not as far along. They're just, a, certainly HDGR is just a little further out than the uh, SMRs and, and different manufacturing requirements uh, that are, some of which don't exist like uh, now, like large scale graphite manufacturing and, and for trisofuel and so on. But these are things that can be built up pretty quickly. Right? We have graphite manufacturers and fuel manufacturers as part of our alliance. So. I, I just want to quickly address the connection between nuclear energy and water. Certainly desalination is a, a very interesting concept for dealing with, for example, the drought that the West Coast is dealing with right now. Um, but it, 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 it was a shock to me when I first heard this number uh, in the state of California, which is the sixth largest economy on the planet, they spend between 10 and 20 percent of their energy in the U.S. Between 10 and 20 percent of their energy moving water, moving fresh water that they already have. You want to do that in a clean way, right? You don't want to be burning petroleum to move uh, water from Northern California to Southern California. So that's another example of where you know. The plentiful and available water tied to clean power, and obviously, the next solution. Do we have any other questions? The sons? Yeah, the orange tie there. Hi. My name is Jacques Besnaino. I used to run Arriva. I should stay on the So, uh, <laughs> so, yeah, so you, you can guess that I'm a pro nuclear. Uh, so my question is, uh, here in the U.S. Uh, there is actually the largest fleet on the planet, 103 reactors, and uh, the fleet is dying pretty fast. Uh, first of because the fleet is aging, and also because of contribution from, from gas, and uh, and, uh, and so we are we saw actually five plants retiring last year. Uh, we may see more uh, retiring uh, pretty soon. I think it's pretty uh, it's, it's a big it's a big issue. Uh, any idea how we can help actually the current fleet operating? Uh, we how we can help actually maybe going from 60 years to 80 years, which would make I mean actually uh, the price of electricity going down. So any any thought about doing anything with the current fleet in addition to what you're trying to do for, with the future fleet? Because at the end of the day, I mean this is a public good. Uh, it's like uh, what we're doing right now because we cannot pay it's like bridges. You know? We cannot pay for toll for next year. So we're going to burn the bridges. We won't be able to cross the river anymore. Jack, that's almost natural to you. <laughs> well, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because obviously I'm designing small reactors now and trying to build them, but I did a lot of work in the past on sustaining the existing fleet. But the answer is every utility that's operating the large nuclear plants today, with the exception of a couple of Exelon plants that they're trying to get full recovery in the markets they're in, uh, is looking to extend the lives of those as long as they possibly can, probably 80 years is doable with what people think, and, and, and we'll, the industry will make an effort to do that, and that's fine. The problem is, as a, it's a future-oriented thing to solve the problem. They're already operating today, and we have this problem of, re of reducing emissions. So we need all of them to operate. We need a whole lot more, too. So if we shut them down, we even, the problem's that much bigger. And so then we really need to make a bigger effort. So all the, I, hope there, I hope that the industry is successful on extending the lives safely, which they can do, they've done it before, and that all those plants can continue to operate as long as they're successful doing that. Not all of them will, some utilities will shut some of them down, but we've got to, what, TVA, for example, where I came from, they're asking the question, what's gonna be our fleet of the future when these finally have to be phased out? So we're trying to propose to them that even SMRs for a large system like theirs 
can potentially meet those fleet needs for a system that size. And if they could do it for them, they could do it for anybody. It, it's worth noting, and I didn't quite hear it in your question, that some of the premature retirement retirements that are going on now are in essence due to the low price of natural gas. Yeah, in the in the competitive deregulated uh, atmosphere. So, you know, the obvious thing I guess that the federal government could do because it is a policy and environmental issue is somehow the government could provide some kind of uh, support for the cost of the price of nuclear energy. And that probably in, a, in essence would be one of the cheapest ways to either prevent carbon emissions from growing or depending on how you look at it, uh, uh, lower carbon emissions. So. It, may, it may be a market issue as I indicated on my slide that uh, from a market design, maybe you need a capacity market for base load and a capacity market for other things. They, they don't do it that way right now. Yeah, and I will add that the uh, Nuclear Energy Institute has said publicly that the fight to save those plants is not going to take place here in Washington, that it's a state-by-state -state level issue of the design of some of these electricity markets, which are not really regulated from D.C., although there is some action at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. but. The NEI is devoting a lot of resources now to state-level discussion uh, with commissions uh, and other players to get nuclear plants favorable treatment at that level. Yeah, and that, that's right. I should, shouldn't have put that all on the federal government. I apologize for that. Like Washington. No problem. Correction of that. <laughs> um, is there anybody else with a question they'd like to ask the panel? Um, I have two questions. Uh, given the incidents, Chernobyl and Fukushima, uh, I'm looking at it from the standpoint of a lay person, not knowing the technical details. Um, can, are, are the systems well? Can the systems be foolproof? You know, completely safe if there is a man-made disaster uh, or a natural disaster. My other question is um, regarding the waste uh, fuel loss, used fuel loss. Uh, how much of a concern should that be down the line? Not this generation, maybe two, three, four generations. And also, is there a concern in uh, some small, small developing countries? Let me if I'm wrong. If it's a big country like USA or China or Russia, maybe you can store them in a mountain or somewhere. Uh, far away, right? In a small country, is, is, it a, is it a real concern? That is a good, you've asked good questions and really brought in deep ones. I don't know where um, Jack is. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, I can answer uh, pretty directly. Uh, the newer plants being designed, S SMRs in particular, but also others that are being designed today, now have the Fukushima experience in their hindsight, which they already were required to design the natural disasters. And in most, and they were required to design to the worst case natural disaster they could conceive of in their areas, or that the regulator would say apply to their areas. <clears throat> and in the case of Fukushima, they got it wrong. That, that's one thing that happened. But now that they got it wrong, the rest of us get to make sure we get it right. You know, that's one thing. So we are all, uh, all designed for seismic, we're all designed for flooding. I mean, if you're on a river that have dams upstream, we have to assume they all fail and all that water comes down and inundates our sites. All that is part of the design requirements for any of these SMRs. I mentioned in my presentation the other thing, which is unlike Fukushima, we do not need any operator action, we do not need any AC or DC power, and we do not need any additional water, forget the flooding part, but just water to cool the plant that's designed in the systems to maintain the plant safe and to preserve prevent the release of radiation to the environment. So for that, per, for that from that perspective, we are much safer than those designs that were originally designed in the 60s and 70s, quite frankly. Um, but all new plants are designed to much higher standards than those now. And a lot of them have uh, passive systems that don't rely on active, you know, uh, actions taking place uh, to protect them. So on that side, Yes, the public is going to be protected from natural disasters. The plants are protected from natural disasters. They're going to be cited in areas where you've thrown the most extreme case of anything that could ever be conceived. Now, 
Can the planet put something that's never been experienced in the history of the world or forecast in the history of the world? Well, if it does, it's probably going to be a bigger problem for the region or country where the event happens than it is the nuclear power uh, part of that. Uh, on the uh, waste fuel rods issue, same, same basic issue. For our design, and mostly all the LWRs, they are designing the fuel to be just like fuel that's already been designed before in the sense of not creating a new waste product that has to be managed or, or presents new risk to, to uh, the people in the community. So part of this is we want to be commercialized, get commercialized, and we want the regulator to adopt what we're trying to present to them. If you come up with something brand new that might work in the laboratory but may never work in practice, you're never going to get it approved. So ours fits the exact standard we had today, but that fuel, we talked about it in an earlier um, answer, can be safely managed today for hundreds of years, quite frankly, if not thousands of years. And the fact that it was just readdressed by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission recently, as was mentioned by uh, Mark, uh, where they now said you can store it in these canisters on site safely for 100 years past a 60 year life or an 80 year life, whenever you shut the actual plants down. And, and that would not create a concern. You got lots of time then to deal with additional solutions or doing things going forward. So there's, a, there's no technical issue here. There is a political issue. It's not a safety issue to the public. As a matter of fact, the fuel that was stored in canisters on the Fukushima site was the stuff that never was at risk or in question by anybody. So, you know, we can manage that. Let me address it. So first of all, I want to point out a couple things. Um, it's, it's not well known, but this concept of inherent safety, uh, like uh, like new scales concept, for example, uh, inherent safety has been tested. It was tested and proven 30 years ago. And we've operated reactors where you can basically walk away, go have a martini, and talk about what you want to do next, and it's going to be perfectly fine. Okay, and today's reactor fleet doesn't operate on those principles, but it's tried and tested. It's not speculative. So that's the first message that the community needs to hear. Uh, but the second thing I want to point out is you, you use the term, is it safe? How safe is it? Is it multiply safe? And I think a different question to ask is, at what point is it safer than what we're doing today producing energy? And I would argue that it's safer than many of the other mechanisms that we're using to produce energy today. If you think about the number of people who've died in coal mines, and you compare that to the number of people who've died in a nuclear accident, you have to conclude, if your goal is to protect lives, nuclear is safer. Okay? As far as the waste and storage is concerned, you know, I, I think that if you look at the last 50 years, that proves that you can store nuclear waste safely and securely. We've been doing it for a long time. Fukushima is an excellent example of where, under extreme circumstances of tsunami, it still wasn't a problem. Okay? I think that the, the waste issue is, what do we do for generations to come? And I do believe in my heart that there will come a time where the value proposition of extracting more energy from that used nuclear fuel will make the problem go away because it'll be burning it up instead of storing it. Um, I'm just on the safety thing, the term physics was used and the inherent safety. It's both the issue just on nuclear plant safety is making sure that your fuel never gets, after an accident, never gets hot enough basically to fail and leak fission products. And so most of the Gen 4 reactors, certainly HTGRs, are designed basically, they're large, and you can, if all else fails, basically radiate heat to the ground or air, and you never come close to failing the fuel melt. It's not even a relevant concept. So this concept of physics, I think most of the Gen 4 reactors just use basic physics as opposed to active safety systems. The other thing, uh, you mentioned about small countries and waste. Your, uh, that's probably absolutely right. If um, small countries without a lot of land or no way to dispose of it um, uh, start going nuclear uh, in a big way, I think the concept of an international fuel bank has been talked about where uh, internationally fuel is, is rather than every country having its own fuel cycle of mining, conversion, uh, uh, enrichment, and so on. That that's done, you know, some by some agreed upon, well uh, monitored countries, and that basically those services are provided, and then the waste pickup, if you will, is also provided. So that's one way of dealing uh, with that. And then the other thing that's always sort of stuck in my craw, if I can bid for a half a second, is this concept that 
um, well, nuclear waste is so bad because human beings are going to have to watch out after it or it's going to be monitored. But what that presumes is basically a collapse of civilization, that all of a sudden we become really stupid and we can't deal with this stuff. And I just, I reject that notion that basically civilization is going to go backwards and we're going to get less capable of dealing with this stuff. So, what was the last, what was the last time you were on the hill? That's true. <laughs> or what was the last time I turned on television? Yeah. I know. Right. All right, well, I see that the clock has ticked away to 3 o'clock. I want to thank our panel very much. I want to thank the audience for being with us during this session.